after the recent video that I did on tasting the Swiss cheese and grilling a sandwich with the uh, um, rocket stove, I had several requests to show how I made the uh, sourdough multigrain bread. And for a while there I thought, well, no, I've got a sourdough bread recipe out there already, even though it wasn't multigrain. But the more I got thinking about it, I have changed my method quite a bit. So I am going to do this new video. And it's taking more time, even though it was a longer time process before, it's taking more time now than it did in the past. But uh, most of that time you're not doing anything. I even refrigerate the dough overnight before I finish it on the second day. So I will try to explain as I go along here my reason for, for making these changes, and I think it has really improved the loaf. At the end of the video, I will put up those in-screen things, those pictures of videos that show up, and I will put the other two uh, sourdough videos up there for you to go look at. The first one basically shows how I uh, developed the culture to make the bread, and the second one is making the white loaf of, of sourdough using King Arthur Flowers method uh, completely. I bought my culture from King Arthur Flower, so I, I didn't start it uh, myself from you know the various methods of starting your own sourdough. And I've been very pleased with it. It's an excellent sourdough. It, uh, I make bread at least once a week with it, and uh, it's turning out very nicely. So. Let's get started here and I will explain the differences as I go and, and the reason for making these changes in the method that I'm using anyway to make a sourdough multigrain loaf. Well, this is my sourdough starter which has been in the fridge since the last time I made bread five days ago or so. I always use the same container. I have never washed it or cleaned it out. I'm convinced that by leaving the traces behind along with the part that you're going to store uh, is continuing to develop the flavor of the sourdough. Now at this point I add 8 ounces of flour. I'm using a white bread flour even though it's a multi-grain loaf I, I use white flour for my uh, starter culture always. And the first point of departure here is I'm using cold tap water, 8 ounces of cold tap water. Um, and that comes from following Paul Hollywood, if you know who Paul Hollywood is, the great British baking show there. I like the ones that he does with just him and uh, his companion there, Mary Berry. Uh, and they take turns baking something that's themselves and, and demonstrating it. He always stipulates when making bread that you want to slow the process down as much as possible. The more you slow the process down, the better flavor you'll get and the better structure you'll get in the, in the loaf. So he uses cold water. This method that I'm going to be showing you, I use the cold water as well. And uh, this evening, this is now 9.30, so this evening around 9 o'clock, I will start uh, using some of this to make the sourdough loaf. But uh, I only go so far with it this evening, and then I, I put it in the refrigerator, leave it overnight, and whenever is convenient tomorrow, I, I finish the loaf. So that also uh, develops more structure. Refrigerating a dough uh, in baker's parlance is, is called uh, retarding it. It slows down the, the development of the, of the yeast and the, the rising of the dough, but also in sourdough uh, it develops better at colder temperatures. The flavor develops better at a colder temperature. So I will see you back here in about 12 hours time when I take uh, 16 ounces of this to start making the multigrain sourdough loaf. And what I meant to say is <laughs> this will just remain at room temperature. I don't put it any place where it's warmer like if you were proving a, a loaf of bread or whatever. It just remains at the ambient room temperature for about 12 hours. Well, it's about four and a half hours later since I started the starter. 
vetted anyway. I just wanted you to see that it is starting to work. You can get a look. There are bubbles forming there and it has well, it has increased. It's up quite a bit in the container, but I will let it go until at least 9 o'clock this evening. I just thought this would be a good time to talk about the flower that I'm using. I'm using a multigrain flower and the brand as you can see is Robin Hood but also it's a bread flower which I'm showing you the French side you may not understand that. Okay. It's a bread flower blended. Um, it says a blend of flowers, cracked wheat, cracked rye and whole flax. I suspect that in the, the blend of flowers is that they have blended in a fair amount of uh, white bread flour. You can uh, buy uh, multigrain flour, but you have to be careful. If it doesn't say multigrain bread flour, you're going to have to mix it with another flour in order to get a decent loaf out of it. It will be very, very heavy if you don't uh, mix it. I would say, well, if you mixed it 50%, half a white bread flour and half the strong multigrain flour, you'd probably get a good loaf out of it. May even be able to do it two thirds multigrain and, and one third white. I have checked online, and uh, in the U.S., um, the bread flour that I like the best over there, and I think is a very popular brand, is King Arthur. But unless I'm mistaken, and please correct me if I am, I don't think they sell a multigrain bread flour. One of my subscribers told me that Robin Hood is available in the U.S. Uh, I haven't seen it in any of the local stores in Maine, but perhaps I'm just not looking in the in the right area. But if you could buy one that's already a bread flour, you'd be ahead of the game. But uh, if you want to make a sourdough multigrain or a sourdough whole wheat, you should blend either one of those with. Uh, uh, white bread flour, strong bread flour, in order to get a, a loaf that will rise nicely. You'll get a very heavy, dense loaf if you don't. So That's my little spiel on the flour to use. I'll bring you back when the starter has completed its fermentation and we start to make the loaf of bread. Well, it's really only been a little over 11 hours, but the starter seems to be really active today. Look at that. Oh. Lots of bubbles and it's risen up to three quarters of the size of the, I guess it's a two liter container that I use. Now I weigh everything, so I'm sorry, don't ask me what it is in cups, I haven't got any idea. In my opinion, if you're going to be making bread and if you want a uh, consistent loaf, you need to invest in a four or five dollar set of digital scales. Uh, using dry measure you never get the same thing twice. Now I'm weighing out 16 ounces of the starter. I'm usually fairly good at this. Tonight I suppose I will I only need a little over an ounce more. <laughs> that will do. That's 16 and a quarter ounces, but that will do. And to that, I add 24 ounces of the multigrain bread flour. And 14 ounces of cold tap water. I'll get the stand mixer out and bring you back when I'm ready to mix this up. Okay, I have the bowl on the stand mixer with the dough hook attached. And now we're not really kneading it in this first part here. Uh, four or five minutes of, of mixing just to thoroughly combine everything. 
and then it will rest uh, for 20 minutes before you add the salt and the reason for that is it gives the uh, uh, culture that you've just mixed into the dough a chance to start developing before you add the salt because salt is also a retarder the same as putting it in the well not the same but like putting it in the refrigerator retards the dough slow salt also <laughs> slows down fermentation so you don't add that immediately uh, in the back when that has completely combined That has everything pretty well combined. I just leave it on the stand mixer. I take the dough hook off. And cover it with plastic wrap. Another good thing to have if you're going to be making bread and other baking items as well is a baker's timer. It's on a lanyard, goes around your neck. I set it for everything that I'm doing. I'm, uh, the uh, fermentation process tomorrow before I bake it is two hours and I, I I set everything, so no matter where, when the time is up, this thing's around my neck and it rings. Well, I'll bring you back in 20 minutes time. It's had its 20 minutes rest, and I'm just about to add the two and a half teaspoons of salt. But I'm going to take its temperature. <laughs> and this is not something that I do normally. But in the next process is 10 minutes of kneading. The kneading will also will develop the gluten structure in, in the dough, but it will also increase the temperature of the of the dough. Which uh, helps it to rise better in theory, I guess. Well my digital thermometer says it's 70 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And if I can remember to do it after after it has been kneaded for 10 minutes, I'll take it again. Two and a half teaspoons of salt. I'm using a sea salt, non-iodized, but it doesn't make any difference. You can use just regular table salt. And now it will get kneaded continuously for 10 minutes. The dough has been kneading for full 10 minutes. The temperature has gone up to 78.2, so it, the friction did increase the, the temperature somewhat. It is a wet sort of a dough, which is what I prefer. It makes it a little more difficult in handling it, but a little flour on the board and that's no problem. Now it gets covered again with plastic wrap and it sits at room temperature for an hour which is close to the last thing that I do to it tonight but it will be shaped. I'll bring you back when I shape it before I put it in the fridge. It gets folded. So in an hour's time we shall return. Well, it has rested for an hour Stop kicking the kicking the camera around might be better. Now it it's turned in the flower. Here it rests again. <laughs> it does a lot of resting. Just cover it lightly and it rests for 20 minutes. Well, the dough has had its 20 minutes rest once again. And now basically it just gets folded. Um, make sure it's not stuck to the board first, I guess.
resting allowed it to loosen up like this. So it just gets folded in that direction, turned over. Stretched out again. And that basically is it. Now, in the regular process, it would now rest in this for an hour. But this is the point at which I put it in the refrigerator. And sometime tomorrow I will complete the, the rest of the process and bake the loaf. Um, you could do that first thing in the morning or whenever is convenient, in the afternoon or early evening or whatever. I bring it out of the fridge for about an hour before I start working with it, just to doesn't bring it back up to room temperature, but it, it brings it up enough that you can work with it again. And I'll take a close look at that. I think in the morning we will see, even though it's been refrigerated, it will rise quite a bit. Well, it's close to 13 hours later. I took the dough out of the refrigerator about an hour ago to let it well, not really come to room temperature, but to give it a warm up a bit anyway. As you can see, if you compare that to the last clip there when I put it away last night, it has risen quite a bit, even though it was in the refrigerator. And it becomes easier to handle too. It's not as tacky as it was. Now, shaping it to make it into a loaf. What you're doing here, pulling it over on top of itself continuously until it becomes a bit difficult to do this, there's more of a resistance. What you're doing is building up a surface tension on the other side, which will help the loaf stay together as it goes through its final rise. I think I said it was two hours, well it's actually two and a half hours. At the two hour point you turn the oven on to get it preheated for the loaf. It goes in at the two and a half hour point. That's pretty tight, so I'll say that's good enough. Now I put it in a bowl lined with parchment paper. And I do mine in a Dutch oven, the same as uh, the no-knead bread is done. And I put it in the oven, uh, parchment paper and all, after the top has been slashed. So I'll show you the old Dutch oven that I use. This gets set aside now for two and a half hours. As you can see, this whole thing has seen better days. I'm not sure how long I've had it. I know I bought it at Walmart way back when the uh, no-knead bread craze was just getting started. So it was probably 10 years or, or further back. At some point I lost the handle that was supposed to be on there. I replaced that with a piece of a wire coat hanger. Uh, I know, don't remember what I paid for it, uh, not very much money, let's say in the $20 range, something like that. But as I said, that was when uh, the no-need bread craze was just getting started. Shortly after that, Walmart and everybody else doubled their price on these because they became so popular. This is a six and a half quart model, and the cheapest one available, as I said before. Well scorched inside with bits of bread that have burned on it and whatever. And the loaf that I'm making, uh, well, doesn't fill it to the brim, but it, it comes up almost to the, to the cover. Uh, so if you were going to get yourself a Dutch oven, if you don't have one, six and a half quart would be what you would go for to, to make the loaf that I'm making. But I've been meaning to say all along as well, uh, there's no reason why you can't reduce the size of this loaf. This makes a large loaf. I'll try to remember to weigh it at the end. And what I do is I cut it into two pieces and I freeze half of it. And uh, um, when the other first half is, is gone, I take the second half out of the freezer type thing. I don't like the idea of making a small loaf. You end up doing this far too frequently if you're going to be using this kind of bread a lot. So, 
but you could easily divide this recipe in half or do a three quarters model. You could even do a larger model if you've got something larger to bake it in or if you've got two Dutch ovens or something. So that was my little spiel on this little treasure and as I'll show you later on I put uh, the parchment paper right in with it. There's no worry about the parchment paper catching fire. Um, the oven is at 450 degrees. The edges of the parchment paper get a bit scorched but there's, there's no danger of it burning. Well it has been resting or grising or something for two and a half hours. It does rise as you can see a little bit but really not all that much. However I think it develops a lot of uh, air bubbles inside because it really gets a lot of what they call oven spring when you put it in the Dutch oven and, and put the cover on. Uh, that The purpose of that, if I haven't already said, it, it holds the moisture in that's coming out of the loaf so that it mimics um, a commercial baker's oven which is steam injected. A lot of different methods out there for getting steam in your oven, spraying the oven. I think the one that King Arthur Flower recommends is putting a cast iron pan on the lower rack in your oven and after you put the bread in to dump water into the pan. And the, Anyway, in my opinion, just another way of getting scalded with steam. Um, the Dutch oven thing works very well with this and works very well with the no-need bread method. So, This is called a lam, French word, L-A-M-E. This particular model is the least expensive of them all. I can't remember exactly. I got like a half dozen or so in a package. I buy them on Amazon anyway. If you go on Amazon and do a search for lamb, it's basically just a razor blade and a handle so that you can slash the top of the loaf. And that allows it to expand. Put it in the oven. And that has been preheated, as I said, to 450 degrees. And now it goes back in the oven for 45 minutes with the cover on. Then I remove the cover so that it will uh, brown better and, and cook it for another 15 minutes. If you were going to use a smaller loaf, like half the size of that, I would only bake it for 30 minutes and then 10 minutes or so with the cover off. It's had its 45 minutes at 450. And as you can see, it grew quite a bit. That already is a nice shade of brown, but I never feel this size loaf is fully baked uh, at 45 minutes. And I like the top darker brown, much darker actually. So I'll see you in 15 minutes time. Well, there it is, fresh out of the oven. Uh, 3 pounds 3 ounces, which is 1.4 kilograms was the weight. So as I say, it's quite a large loaf. Um, it would go stale if I didn't freeze half of it. But I can hear it starting to snap there, if you can hear that or not, where it's cooling down. Most bakers will tell you that the loaf isn't fully cooked until it's cooled down. It's continuing to cook inside and that's why you shouldn't cut one until it's cool. Anyway, the last thing I will do on this video is I will cut it in two in preparation for freezing it and uh, taste a slice of it, of course. Well, I've been out hiking with Angel for a couple of hours and the loaf still feels just slightly warm, but I'm going to cut it. interior structure of it. I guess you can see that. And I'm going to take a slice, butter it, and see what it tastes like. I like the first slice because it has more crust. And 
nice big bubble there. Bubble filled full of butter now. Yeah. Well, let's see what this is like. Well, I just love the stuff, so I have a biased opinion anyway, but sort of stretchy, chewy. Very moist in the center, and a lovely sourdough flavor and smell. I've been gone for two hours. When I come back, talk my mouthful. When I come back, you could smell the sourdough as soon as we came in the kitchen. Well, if you liked this video and thought it was useful, please feel free to share it on your social media channels or with friends. About right now, those two videos that I talk, spoke about at the beginning <clears throat> should be popping up on the screen. It's sort of one long video divided in two. Uh, the first one will be on the left-hand side of the screen, and the second one is on the right-hand side of the screen. So, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did making it. Thank you very much for watching.